another episode of Being Human. Delighted today. I'm here with Eileen Mikuzik. She is a cosmological storyteller, uh, a biofield tuner, and the author of two books, Electric Body, Electric Health, and Tuning the Human Biofield. Eileen, welcome. Very warm welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I, I got introduced to this work because I saw you on a podcast with on the Alpha Vedic podcast. And I was like, oh, wow, she sounds interesting. And then I found your website and I, and I did some work with the, with the Sonic Slider that I bought. So I started to experience you know, this work. And interestingly for me, the benefit was on posture. Uh, that was where I first saw it. So, and, I, and I got very intrigued in this idea that we might have a biofield and maybe there's something to these tuning forks and I sort of stated connecting to your work and like I say had that an initial experience around the value for for me in terms of posture and so the fact that we've now got an opportunity to explore it in more depth and figure out what this thing is the biofield and uh and how working with it can have have benefits for us uh, so that's yeah why I, I wanted to have this conversation Nice. And there's the other aspect of this work, which is our understanding of cosmo cosmology. And yeah, you're, you're, as you said, a cosmological storyteller. And that's something it, I'm sort of exploring in parallel, right? I've explored the practical benefits of this work and also, okay, so what, what are the implications for this in terms of how we understand the universe and, and so on? And so, I wonder whether it's best to start with some of the grounding of the principles that we're talking about, which kind of underpin this approach. And then, as we discussed before we came on, maybe a, a live demo of this so people see, you know, how, how it gets applied. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this idea of the electric body um, and the human biofield, could you just like lay out, you know, what we mean by that? And, and the broader context in terms of what that means for sort of the, the physics that underpin it. The term biofield was coined in 1994 by a panel of National Institute for Health scientists who wanted a word to describe the field of energy and information that may or may not surround and interpenetrate the human body. So initially to describe the field, uh, which is, Controversial in Western medicine, there's a kind of denial that this even exists. And what I discovered through my work with tuning forks and also my research was that the body actually has an electrical system that we're not taught about, that's not really described. It's really a kind of not seeing the forest for the trees kind of example. Uh, most people realize that their heartbeat is electrically driven, that their brain waves are electric, uh, that their blood carries a charge, our nervous system, um, even our bones are electric. And what this really points to is something that Robert O. Becker talks about in his books from the early 80s, uh, The Body Electric and Cross Currents. In those books, he talks about the body's electrical system. Uh, but, but that's really the only place or one of the only places that I've I've found that phrase. And so what it all points to is that the body has electric current flowing through it. And that's what keeps our eyes open and keeps us alive and uh, kind of keeps everything on and running. And when we die, our light goes out. Right? So the electrical system, that current stops flowing. Anything that has electric current flowing through it has a magnetic field around it. And that's just basic science. So the human body is no different. The, the same energy that is flowing through us, beating our heart, making us think and feel, um, is also present in, in the field around us, in our magnetic field. And so I've changed the definition of the biofield to include the fact that it is the body's electrical system in its entirety. You can't really cleave out magnetic field from the electric current it's really all one thing right and 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 the way i visualize it it's 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 a, it's a kind of a, a bubble around us but that penetrates us um 
and and that has info and that also stores information about that. Yeah, so that's also something that I discovered <clears throat> bouncing sound off people with my tuning forks and listening to the ping back. I ended up really exploring the atmosphere around the body and discovering that it had an anatomy and physiology that was the same from everybody, just like our digestive organs are kind of in the same place. So the anatomy of our field is the same. And I discovered that it had a membrane, that, it, that it's actually a bubble or shaped like a torus with a central channel down the middle, the ida and the pingala, the positive and negative charges, the ascending and descending currents that comprise and, and maintain our uh, body's biofield. And there's a double layer plasma membrane that it's us as a bubble. And those, uh, the field extends about six feet around us. And so, you know, when we were having to distance six feet, I thought that that was an interesting thing. And it can change when people are sick or really tired. It can get smaller. Um, some people have very big fields. Certainly, we've all been around people that you can sense that they have a big field. But I would say on average, most people on average day, it extends around six. And what's a double layer plasma membrane? <laughs> Well, uh, all of our cells have double layers. Uh, any any kind of bubble, really, you know, it's a it's a double layer. It's got uh, an inner boundary and an outer boundary, and then the electric charge is stronger or greater uh, at at that membrane. So when you're passing a fork through the field, you can feel it. You can feel the charge. Your fork gets more vibrating. If you were looking with dowsing rods, you'd find it in the same place. Um, so it's, it's an area where the charge is greater than the ambient right. charge that's within the, the membrane. And what's plasma? Plasma is uh, the fourth state of matter. Um, it's something that we oddly don't, most of us don't learn about. Uh, and basically what it is, is it's the flow of electric current and, and it's everywhere. So our atmosphere that we breathe in is a plasma. Uh, the sun is a plasma. Northern lights are a plasma. Lightning is a plasma. The spark you get when you touch your cat <laughs> is a plasma. Uh, that it's it is uh, electric charge, it's current, and uh, and it shows up in different ways. Um, there's different modes of it: dark current mode, glow mode, arc mode. You're about a plasma welder and that sort of arc of electricity in that. That's a plasma. So it can be very diffuse or it can be very concentrated. Right. And, and the plasma, so, so there's a plasma membrane, but there's also just kind of, but the whole field is made up of plasma as well. Is that right? Yeah, the whole field is a flowing electric charge. So you right. have a greater concentration of it in the membrane, and then you have a sort of more diffuse plasma, a bioplasma within your magnetic bubble. Right, right. And and in terms of like the the broader cosmology, so what 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 was the implications then for the for everything that we're swimming in? What because because you talk obviously talk about that in the book. Yeah, well, our current cosmological story is really one of darkness, separation, entropy, and mystery. <laughs> you know, we don't know what dark energy or dark matter or black holes really are, but they're everywhere and they're dark. Uh, <laughs> and black holes suck in light and. Uh, everything is random and chaotic and separate. And, and that's a very depressing cosmological story because it's actually a lie. And it's, it's only three states of matter in that solid, liquid, and gas. But there are actually two additional states of matter uh, that are illuminated and connected, and that's plasma and ether. And in order to understand the biofield tuning model, you have to bring in these additional states of matter. Um, there's also additional forces of nature that we don't learn about. We learn about entropy and gravity, which are forces that pull things down and pull things apart, right? So in this dark, disconnected world that's being sort of rendered into oblivion. <laughs> um, but there's also syntropy, which is the opposite of entropy. If entropy is the force that causes things to fall apart, syntropy is the force that brings things together, that is creative and and even though entropy is continually taking place, so is syntropy. Um, you know, that's evident in when we look around us. 
Um, levity is energy that's going upward. Sit and listen to a steel drum band. You can feel the levity of the water molecules in you bouncing, going up, right? Because sound waves fall upward. So in order to frame uh, the whole practice of, of biofield tuning, of working with tuning forks in the biofield, I realized that I had to take the time to, to tell a different cosmological story, to introduce people to ether and um, the luminiferous ocean of clear light, the essential fabric of creation itself that everything is made of that it spins itself through torsion into the positive and negative charges of uh, like masculine and the feminine. And that, <clears throat> that becomes plasma and then plasma will form itself into what we call gases, liquids, and solids. But ultimately everything is really spun light. There, there is no solidity. The solidity of things is an artifact of our human perception. Things appear solid, but really uh, it's just dense ether. <laughs> and, uh, and because ether is, is all one thing uh, and outside of time, really, the, it's the movement within the ether that creates time, the waves, the periodicity of waves traveling through the ether. Uh, that's why distance tuning works because you know, that's a little hard for people to wrap their heads around like, well, how could you use tuning forks on me at a distance? And it's because we're operating within the laws of the ether where you have instantaneous resonance and self-awareness in, in all of it. Um, I don't use the term quantum or quantum entanglement. I, I just don't find that language and conceptualization helpful. A lot of confusion around what quantum really means. And to me, the concept of resonance in the ether is really crystal clear. So, uh, and then the, the plasma piece the you know, the light has really been left out. And I think that when I discovered plasma back in 2009, you know, I'd been a seeker for a long time since 1987, I had been reading self-help books and going to courses and buying CD sets and doing my very best to conquer, to overcome the low level angst, depression not good feeling that I felt about being human. And when I discovered plasma, I realized that I had found the light that I was looking for, that it was actually all around me, but that I hadn't been given the language of it or the concept of it to describe it. And, and that the, that light was inside of me and that my spiritual body, if you will, um, was actually biological. It was my body's electrical system, my inner light was the same light that powered the stars and the sun and lightning bugs and lightning was the same light that that powered me and in that realization i felt in every cell in my body my fundamental connectivity to all of life itself and that had really been missing and i really fell in love with plasma actually <laughs> I, I spent as much time as i could learning about it and really kind of fell into a romance with the stars and the sun and the and and just the air that I was breathing, um, because on a very deep level, I understood my connected. Right. I love in the book where you say your your husband said you love plasma more than you love. Yeah, me. he did. He said to me one day, he's like, "You don't love me. You love plasma." <laughs> the best self help you ever read read was the Electric Sky. Is that right? Yeah, the Electric Sky. Now I will say that my. My cosmological view is always evolving based on information that mm. I receive. Uh, and, and I've come into a place of kind of questioning um, the shape and nature of our realm and of space. Uh, I don't believe one thing or another, but I, you know, I'm, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that I don't know, but I do know that the light is there. And I do know that, um, that, <clears throat> It's really what we live on, right? Because you can go for weeks without food. I know, I do know some breatharians on social media, or people that claim to be. Uh, you can go for days without liquids, but you can only go a few moments without breath. And we are breathing in uh, uh, 
electricity. You know, that's why people like to go to the beach or go forest bathing, because there's a greater density of electric charge in the air that recharges us. And uh, yeah, so they, it's, it's interesting how most of it is in our language. And yet that's sort of official story, but a lot of this doesn't match. You know, exactly. Yeah. And you, you find that in a lot of places where we're, we're already talking about it, but because we, we kind of sense it or know it, um, even if it hasn't, if science hasn't given an official nod to, to whatever. But the, so really our, our relationship with our breath and how openly and gently and freely and gratefully we breathe is so directly related to mental, physical, and emotional well-being. And I think most people don't realize that the primary life force that is animating them is coming from their breath. Uh, so many people hold their breath, have shallow breathing, have anxiety, which absolutely disrupts the natural, easy flow of breath. Um, and, and a lot of people overthink. So they hold their breath and they overthink and then wonder why they're exhausted at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, right. Because they haven't been introducing sufficient charge into their body's battery to keep it uh, topped off as they go through their day. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I discovered a thing a few years back. Uh, well, quite a long while back now. Before I got any knowledge of this biofield, but just uh, you know, got got introduced to this idea is really valuable to Earth and built earthing mats, and I lie on an earthing mat, and I have a earthed. Uh, mat that I use when I when I work on my computer, and that has, I've found has made a, a massive difference. Um, and the barefoot walking and so on. Um, yeah, I started walking barefoot back in 2012, and after discovering earthing then, and you know the electric body, of course, it all makes mm. sense. And I started going out walking barefoot for about a half an hour every day, <clears throat> and I couldn't believe the difference that it made. That that I had some low level inflammation, it disappeared. I stopped waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I just felt so much better. And I, and I thought, gosh, you know, I've tried all these fancy things uh, for so many years to improve my health. And who knew it was as easy as just taking off my shoes? <laughs> yeah, and I found it with the gym, like I could do the hardest workout as long as I sleep. Uh, I wake up barely any stiffness. Um, oh. It's, uh, yeah, it's extraordinary. The power. Right. And that, that really speaks to our electric body and our tendency to build up positive charge during the day. We're around devices. We're being continually bombarded by all of the waves going through the air. And when we wear rubber sole shoes, it creates an insulator that stops us from going into electromagnetic equilibrium with Earth. So people build up this positive charge. They have a deficiency of negative charge. Uh, when we Earth, we we go into equilibrium, we ground the positive charge, we pull up the negative charge, and, uh, and that helps us to be uh, in concert with our environment. We're all kind of living in these insulated little droopy bubbles um, <laughs> because we're not grounded. Yeah, I, I heard of a study, I think they did it in Japan, um, a news organization, they had one floor of journalists who were all grounded, whilst they worked during the day, and the other that weren't, and they, they checked that creativity and the productivity and, and, and these other markers and they found it was considerably enhanced in, in those that were earth during the day. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's good to have that kind of comparison. Definitely. Yeah. I also, when I started going through menopause, uh, that I had such an incredible need to be grounded in. And I went out and I bought leather soled shoes, which back then you couldn't really find very many, but I was looking yesterday on the internet and there's so many more brands now than there were. Uh, you know, I just had a pair of moccasins. I wore them everywhere. And I'm the kind of girl that likes cute shoes, you know, and heels and things like that. Um, but I found that when I wore the moccasins, uh, when I peed outside as much as I could, that I was able to make it through menopause with like barely a blip. And I think a lot of what happens to women when you go through when you're no longer discharging every month um, through having a period that that charge starts to build up and you get hot flashes and you get weight gain and you get all kinds of discomforts. But if you're really solidly grounded when you go through that, it is way, way easier. And that was just instinctually 
with my understanding of the electric system, right? That I was like, oh, I really need grounding. So, right. yeah, it helps with many things. Right. And I can imagine, and the peeing, right? Because you're, you're, then you're creating a, yeah. Yeah. A, I mean, a channel, a channel, channel, right? channel, right? Yeah, channel, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, you mentioned this word ether. So we talked about plasma. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what you mean by ether. Hmm. Well, ether has been described, uh, you know, it's the classic term. It's been around for a really long time. Uh, ether was taken out of our cosmological story and replaced with the vacuum, with nothing. So this, this, this ocean of clear light that light waves travel through came nothing. And then we're told, oh, well, light waves travel through a vacuum. Well, how the heck can a wave travel through nothing? Like it's highly illogical. And, and, and science kind of took a turn with relativity theory and I don't know, just, just a lot of nonsense uh, that isn't useful um, and, and created a lot of problems for itself actually in taking out the ether. And then it got put back in if you, you, uh, the Higgs field. If you read the definition of the Higgs field, well, that's ether. It's like, okay, so scientists took out ether and then, and then this Higgs guy like put it back in and named it after himself. <laughs> but, but it's the same definition. Uh, it maybe some people call it the quantum foam. Um, it's just the idea that, that there is a fundamental fabric of life that all of creation arises from and falls back into. And it could also be called the Akasha or the Akashic record because, because it's like a giant hard drive that records every single thing that ever is, was, or will ever be. Um, you could even call it God or the fabric of life itself. Um, it, it contains uh, the patterns in the geometry that life arranges itself onto tonic solids. It is an information field, but it's also a fluid of sorts. And, and it's the movement within this fluid that creates charge, that, that creates plasma. Uh, everything moves in spirals, even though we weren't taught about spirals in school either, uh, like the phi spiral. Um, Music, sound moves in spirals, light moves in spirals, water moves in spirals, blood spirals through our veins. Uh, and, and it's this spiraling action that, that happens in ether that, that gives rise to creation. So it is the absolute unifying field that all of life arises and takes place. In. Right. What's a phi spiral? Uh, I wish I had an image of it. Uh, Nature unfolds in, in these uh, pr very specific proportions, the golden mean, the golden, uh, the golden rectangle, and you see just the proportion of uh, beauty. Beauty, truth, order, harmony uh, unfolds in these very specific proportions. And I have two new forks actually based in phi in the golden mean. Have a set of forks called the Fibonacci forks that are the eleventh and twelfth position in the Fibonacci sequence, the mathematical unfolding, unfurling of life, and uh, and these forks between the two of them, but I have them right here, uh, create um, create phi. So this is eighty nine hertz and one hundred and forty four hertz, and when you divide uh, one forty four by eighty nine, you get one point six one eight, which is phi. A lot of us learn yeah. about pi, 3.141, da, 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 da. but we don't, again, in school, we don't learn so much about phi. And phi is really present in uh, classical architecture and art. Uh, even a business card is in a phi ratio. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Because it's pleasing. It's, it's a pleasing thing to look at. Um, when we look at classical architecture, there's something that makes us, our eyes rest. Uh, when we look at uh, modern brutalist architecture, there's there's none of that. That's all really been removed. Um, and it's led to a very ugly world, an ugly built world, because we've lost that fundamental principle of being in harmony with natural law. Right. Got it. OK. Um, and, and so it's 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 by, it's the, I, I can visualize the, the Fibonacci, the spiral is 
is that use phi as a as a ratio as part of it? Is that yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Like a Nautilus shell, right? Right. It's a good yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Uh, we've got a lot of Nautilus shells in our house because I took the kids to the. There's a part of the British coastline where they're they're just falling out of the cliff. So uh, yeah, we've got. So. Yeah, and it's they're so appealing, right? There's something mm. about it that your eye wants to rest on that that is that is attractive, and it's because of that beautiful natural ratio and proportion. It's musical, right? right? It, it's like frozen music. It's the same way it like unfurls. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know you've got a hard stop. So do you think we've got some time to um, squeeze in yeah, a, a live demo? Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, m for many years when I started doing this work, I started in 1996, Eating Forks. And, and, People would ask me if I could do this at a distance. I always said no, because it seems so silly to me that I'm like, this is physics. It's sound waves on the body. Like, there's no way I could do it at a distance. This is before I understood ether. And when I was working on tuning the human biofield, I was friends with a doctor named Dr. Carl Merritt, who uh, was an MD who had a practice in California. And he helped me with my master's thesis and my book. And at one point in the process, he asked me if I wanted to do an experiment and try doing it at a distance. And uh, even though I was very skeptical about it, I am a scientist and I do love experiments. And so I was willing to give it a go. And he lay down on a treatment table in his office in California. And I approached my treatment table in Vermont as if he was there, even though he wasn't. And much to my amazement, the same pattern of energy and information that would show up around an actual body appeared around my table. And because I've been doing this work for many years, uh, even though it seems sort of odd, when you use a tuning fork in somebody's biofilm and you start at the outer edge, <clears throat> it's like dropping on a needle, a needle on an album and reading the vibrational record of someone's life. And the outer boundary of our field contains information from gestation, just inside that is birth. And then as we move along, it's like moving along a timeline. So if somebody is 40, I'm going to find information that was generated by their electrical system when they were around 20. And so because of this, I can read people like a book. I can, I can go through and I can it's kind of like a sonic braille that I taught myself over the many years of exploration. That sound means that, and that sound means that, and that feeling relates to that. And so I went through his whole field, my little sonic braille kind of thing, and I was able to identify ages where he had a hard time, he had a head injury when he was five, personality of his mom, personality of dad, where he had inflammation, what organs weren't working quite properly, uh, you know, a number of, of other pertinent things. And I took notes and then we got on the phone and we didn't have any open line of communication. We just connected by intention. And we got on the phone and I read my notes to him and he said, Eileen, all of that is exactly correct. And I felt a state change while you were working on me. I feel it. I feel lighter. And I took my blood sugar before and after, and there is definitely a significant beneficial change. And so I was really amazed by that. Like, I was really surprised, you know, because I went into it sort of skeptical and almost invested in my own position of impossibility, right? I wasn't trying to prove anything. If anything, I was trying to disprove it so I would be right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I couldn't ignore the, the fact of what had just happened. So I spent, I spent some time doing distance sessions. My next one was with a friend in Australia. I'm like, okay, it works from Vermont, California. Will it work from Vermont, Australia instantaneously? And it did. And the same story. So for a number of months, I did these sessions without being connected to people. And it really forced me to go even deeper into understanding this language of vibration where I could tease out like that sound is a heartbreak. That sound is a move, you know, because I didn't have somebody on the table to be like, what happened when you were 12, you know, and have yeah. them tell me. So I really had to, to go really deep. And this language of vibration is such a pure language because it, it can't hide anything. It can't lie. It, it is the, the truth as it was laid down and as it needs to be. Uh, and 
And then I started doing it over Zoom and, you know, being in connection with people while I was doing it. Uh, but, you know, for people who are skeptical, like, I totally get it. <laughs> I totally get it. It's, it's a kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around. Uh, but in this idea of the biofield, your body is actually inside your mind, not the other way around. The biofield I've come to see is what we would call our conscious mind or subconscious mind. It's our memory. It's where all of our memories are stored. Our memories are generated by uh, our electrical system. Everything we see and smell and touch and taste and feel and think and all our interactions are all impulses in the electrical system. And these, uh, all of these continual like little needle readouts are recorded in our biofield. Uh, and so the body is inside the mind. And, and if this is your mind, if you are out here, like where do you end? Mm. Like on a certain level, you end at the plasma bubble, but that doesn't keep everything in, right? And so really, we are all infinite beings connected to the ether and to the all. Um, we have a, a, low, a focal point, which is our body and our sense of I. Um, but, but we also are everywhere as well. Mm. We're part of the ether. We're part of the one. And so I can take the information field that is you, kind of like taking a book off your bookshelf. Yeah. Or you know, <laughs> or us going in and editing a Google Doc together, right? That we can we can sort of pull that file from the cloud, and uh, it, because it's accessible and on it together, which is pretty miraculous too when you think about it. Um, <laughs> so so the information field that is you uh, is is right here, and I can be just through my intention. Uh, say okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to you, and and we're gonna just see. And so in in sound healing, uh, what we do is we listen first, right? So tuning forks aren't about like I've got this coherent frequency, and I'm gonna come in and tune here. It's really very much a response. Uh, the tuning forks will initially resonate with the information that's present because there it's a living. Fork. And you know, so many people, they always want to automate it and mechanize it and plug it in somehow. Um, but this, the, the acoustic nature of it makes it very live and, and it allows the fork to have a conversation with your body. It meets your body where it's at. And then it entrains you into a more coherent expression. A strong, coherent signal will overtake and entrain a weak, incoherent. Our bodies are really self tuning instruments. And when given the opportunity to hear and sense themselves as sort of biofeedback, uh, they'll use that feedback uh, to put themselves in order. Just like if you haven't seen a mirror in a while and you finally come across one and your hair is a mess and you've got a poppy seed in your teeth, right? You use that reflection to put yourself in order. And so the tuning fork acts like a mirror, a vibrational mirror that allows the body to become self-aware of what it's doing. It's a metronome. It's producing a steady rhythm. So the body can, can gauge its and, and readjust its rhythmic expression. Uh, and it's, it's a steady tone. So the body expresses itself tonally uh, more harmoniously with this reflection. So it's a really, we're, we're, we are essentially self-tuning instruments that can be retuned with tuning forks, which is so simple, right? <laughs> Right. It, it gives me a, a kind of a guide. It gives my body, okay, there's, there's something I can tune to. Exactly. To, to, to improve my state. Yeah, um, to just come into coherence and order yeah. you know, and relax. Because <laughs> when we've mm. got incoherence and noise in our signal, it makes us tense, just like a fire alarm going off makes you tense. Uh, noise in our own signal from trauma responses creates all this tension, which then restricts breathing. So. Basically, the only claim we make in biofield tuning is that it helps you to relax and breathe. But in that relaxation and in that deeper breathing, there is more enlivening and healing place inside that state. You can't heal when you're in a stressed state because there's too much restriction. Uh, so this just helps to invite relaxation wherever we're holding subconscious tension that's restricting blood and electricity and lymph and everything from flowing. So right. then our bodies are self-healing and we just need to get, get the tension and the constriction out of the way 
So all of those processes can do what they do. Right. Got it. Yeah. So let me ask you, do you have any aches or pains or problem areas? Like what? what what's... I don't have any. So there's a couple of things that occasionally happen. Sometimes I get a little bit of a twinge, usually in my left knee. Um, when I do lunges and stuff at the gym, that'll occasionally happen. Um, and then what I, I frequently get tension around uh, my shoulders and, and my neck. Um, I had a long drive last night and I was actually aware as I was been driving for about an hour that yeah i started to get tension across the back yeah all right well let's uh let's sort of hold that in focus so i'm going to start off i i don't have an awful lot of tuning forks it's really easy there's so many tuning forks out there it's really easy to go overboard people like get a whole bunch and then they don't know what to do with them uh so i try to keep my tools pretty simple i have five unweighted tuning forks and uh they are based in um well, let's see. Three of them are based in the Solfeggio series. I don't use the C major scale, although I did back in the beginning. Um, and then I have 144 hertz, which is one of the Fibonacci numbers. And we just released today, actually, uh, 222 hertz, which isn't really in any system uh, that I'm aware of, but what I found it to be a very pleasing and useful frequency. So we'll get to that one. Okay, so, uh, and anybody else who's watching, this can be for you as well. If you have tense shoulders, um, I'll just set the intention that I'm, I'm working on everyone who shows up and watches and, uh, and we'll see if this can help you as well. So to start, just close your eyes and take a, a moment to scan inner space and how you feel. Don't try to change anything. We just really want to encourage somatic awareness and not thinking. If you go into your thinking mind, um, you, you interrupt your ability to really perceive what's going on somatically. I know it's not easy for a lot of people to quiet the mind and really go into the body, but what we want to do. So you now, even as we're tuning in, I feel the tension in my throat. Uh, a lot of people have uh, barriers to expression in the throat. A lot of tension in shoulders is sounds that we're not making truth that we're not saying desires we're not expressing emotions we're not allowing to flow through end up with sort of a lump feeling in the throat uh and shallow breathing uh, locked diaphragm so let's just take a moment to consciously deepen the breath so we're going to take three breaths so the first one in the chest upper rib cage nice really big full breath there and exhaling it down the spine and out the tailbone just with imagination and intention. And then the next breath into the belly, the whole area around the navel, really filling up the sort of middle of the torso with breath. Again, exhaling it down the spine, out the tailbone, into the crown. And then the last breath will breathe into the pelvic floor, really filling the lower belly. And then exhale. So I'm going to begin just by listening to your feel. Take a few moments to tune in. Okay, so what I'm noticing is initially your, your signal comes in really strong and clear. You have a really strong constitution. You have a really good flow already established. It feels like you breathe pretty well um, and, and you're, you're grounded, you're embodied. Uh, but as we start to listen more deeply, there, there's a kind of like feeling of things sort of curling up around the shoulders and uh, a kind of heaviness in there. Um, I'm also getting really hot. So that's often a sign that the, the emotions that are 
um, not flowing through or what is contributing to that tension is a, one of the hot emotions. So that can be um, frustration, anger, um, even guilt and shame can be on the hot side. And um, I'm inclined to think with you that it's more frustration than anything that you do your best to transmute and, uh, you know, not let it get the best of you. Um, but does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but part of that is an actual suppression that's happening. Instead of figuring out a way to channel it or let it flow um, so that it's not getting stuck in you, you're kind of the, the gatekeeper at the base of the neck is saying frustration you're not allowed it's like a bouncer at a bar <laughs> like frustration can't come up into cognition and expression so all you molecules of frustration you need to hang out here in the shoulder they're all sort of around back there being kind of hot and frustrated <laughs> uh, <laughs> right so and that this is a sound like oh like if you were really to let it out or uncap it it, it feels a little like ah, you know yeah. like like too much or inappropriate or bad form, you know, so it's just not going to go there, but it is a, got a little bit of an uproar sort of thing. Even a little bit of like a, what I call like Hulk smash, you know, like there's yeah. a part of you that, that wants to just be like, rah. Uh, and so, That's so true. I never, I never do that. I, I well, very rarely do I allow, allow myself to express frustration. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's what's going on in here. Right. And it's, uh, and there's a little bit of like mother energy here that maybe your mom was hysterical sometimes or, you know, so, and, and that, that, uh, you know, you don't, you didn't like it. You don't want to be that way. I'm going to, I'm going to keep a lid on this energy that wants to come up and out in this kind of bah, sort of way. Right. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so this is the sound of this, like, you know, <clears throat> stuffing it in, stuffing it down, holding it back, judging it. Um, so this is a, sort of an overlay of repression on top of this energy that that wants to come up and out in almost eh, like a hysterical. Not that's not the best word, but you know, when we think about when somebody is hysterical, they just all this energy is just coming up and out, and they they are not putting a lid on it, right? So. So this is this dull, heavy sound that that is, um, oh no, don't go there. Right? But, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but there's that that is trapping energy and that's trapping life force and it's creating pain. So this is the mirroring, this is the reflecting and the kind of tuning into uh, how energy is flowing, how it's expressing or not expressing. So now I'm going to come in with the 144 hertz fork. And we're just going to keep our awareness in the shoulders and see what this frequency wants to do. So I'm just going to be quiet for a moment and bring this out for a bit. Right, and everybody watching, make sure you're breathing. Good. So that already feels better when I'm, when I'm noticing on my end, that energy kind of moved from being stuck on either side of the base of the neck more to the middle. Um, that strong constitutional sound that I heard at the beginning, 
uh, I'm hearing again. So this is a sort of in reintegration of these tensions and allowing that energy to come back into flow in a more balanced way. So I'm curious what you're noticing. Yeah, definitely. I'm feeling, yeah, it's softening at the back of the neck. Uh, yeah, 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 really interesting. Yeah. So let's come in with one more. I'll use the 222 and we'll just hang out with this for, for a few strikes and see what we notice with this one. Okay, one more. Good. One nice deep breath in the belly. Really big breath. And then really exhale down. And then give yourself like just a little shake. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. I feel right. a ton cool. lighter, more joyous. Yeah. yeah. I feel joyous. Yeah. More joyful, right? And that, that 22 hertz fork really is of one. It just really kind of brings you into your center, grounds you, lets that, that syntropic energy of joy and light just sort of enter and express. Because when we're holding down frustration or hysteria, we're holding down joy too. That, that same yeah. energy that is locking down these negative emotions is also locking down the other uh syntropic levity kind of expressions of joy of playfulness um of excitement right and we really want to allow that upflow um but if we've had experiences with people whose upflow was incoherent uh or you know then we or ourselves right and we're like i can't allow that incoherent uprising uh but we can absolutely allow the Right. Yeah. And as you spoke about the mother energy, I, my mother wasn't hysterical. She was very stoic, but, but my dad was right. But it, what it meant right. was in relation to my mother, I always felt like, well, I can't be like dad. Like he's the only one who gets to play like the anger card or the frustration card in, in our house. That's something like yeah. that. So yeah, yeah, that, that's made sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It isn't always easy to tell, right? Cause in that kind of case, the, your mother is more being more the masculine one and your father yes. is or the feminine very That's often right. it is the woman who's hysterical but you know you don't you very rarely end up with both parents <laughs> that, are, that are like that there's usually they balance each other out and okay but yeah and then we make judgments about it right i mean i know my mom was when she got angry she got really angry and she threw things and i was like well that's bad form and i really went into suppressing anger my whole life because uh, right you know, and i i interpreted anger arising in me as a sugar craving because I used sugar to pacify my own anger, which a lot of people do, sugar or wine, or, you know, it's easy to do. Um, but then you're pacifying your fire and your, you know, it's our fire is our passion. It's our energy. It's our digestive strength. Uh, so it's really important that all of our uh, different energies, different elements, different emotions, figure out a way to flow and express in ways that are healthy and balance because when we restrict anything we restrict uh life life itself from flowing yeah yeah absolutely. and um, i'm curious as well because you you also described this combing where we sort of pull blockages into the into the set into the center line or into the track were, were you doing some of that there or is that a different technique yeah, that's a different technique. You know, as I've gotten older, I've gotten lazier. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I used to, whenever I did a distance session, I would set up a table and I would go through the field and I would comb. Uh, and I still do do that. I mean, that's definitely an approach we can do. But but for ease of, uh, you know, this sort of Zoom, I just sit and listen. Just listen. And then the body just keeps 
kind of bringing up the next incoherence, the next area. I'm like, okay, this sorted itself out. Now this is arising. This sorts itself out. But biofield tuning proper, you you know, either whether at a distance or uh, in person, you lie down on a table and the practitioner uh, combs through your field and does what I call an adjustment, very much like a magnetic field adjustment, which then shifts the way electricity is flowing through the body because magnetic fields guide and inform electric currents. So oftentimes when people have pain someplace, they have an imbalance in their magnetic field. They have extra density of magnetism. Let's say uh, somebody is always uh, taking care of others, saying yes when they need no. And, uh, and so they've imbalanced their field because they're not taking care of themselves. They're not honoring their own body. Uh, and what that magnetism will do is it will draw the electricity in the body over there. And pain is pretty much too much current through those wires. And so by adjusting the magnetic field, we adjust the way electricity is flowing through the body. We can get people out of acute pain pretty quickly, uh, 15, 20 minutes. If you're going to 8, 9, 10 on the pain scale, and I come in and I do an adjustment, we can get you way down um, very fast. So it's, uh, it, you know, it's a completely different way of, of yeah. considering how we treat the body to do it <clears throat> from the field instead of the body itself. And I don't know, we, and this could be our final question. I know you've got to run, but, but why is it so much quicker? Well, that's a really good question. Why is it? Well, because it's primary, because we're working in the blueprint, right? The, the field is really the blueprint of what's going on in the body. It's like an exploded view, you know, like when you get furniture to assemble, right? And like the screw goes here. And so everything that's going on in the body is going on in the field. And so by, by rearranging the blueprint, then the body just rearranges itself to that balanced blueprint. So I, I, it, that's this is what the body is always working off of as it's generating itself. So if you change the pattern, the rhythm, the flow, the wiring in the field, then that happens in the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than trying to sort of manipulate the dense matter, you're changing the whole subtrait, right? Yeah, the subterrain. That's a great mm. way to put it. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. I know you've got a hard stop. Um, so I could go on forever, but I'm going to honor your timing. So uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, the biofieldtuning.com, bio is that where you would send people? Is that right? Yeah, biofieldtuning.com. Or I have a YouTube channel with lots of videos that talk about the Sonic Slider. And uh, I also do a lot of free sessions online. I have a series called Sonic Sunday. Uh, there's 18 of them okay. now. 18 free tune-ups uh, and, and wisdom. This work has really taught me a lot about being human and how to be a better human. That's what I like to share. So um, I guess you'll just have to have me back, right? So we can <laughs> get some more of these. Absolutely, sessions. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. My mind map has got so many legs on it we didn't talk about. So there's definitely room for another, uh, another show. Okay, awesome. So Byfield Tuning Club, come. People can sign up for your, your free tune-ups on a Sunday. We'll put the links to the books again, Tuning the Human Biofield and Electric Body, Electric Health. Um, anything else, or, or is that enough for people to do? And the YouTube channel, of course, which we'll put a link to. YouTube channel. Um, well, I just that humans are designed to be in harmony with themselves, with each other, and with our environment. That's our factory settings. When we bring ourselves back into tune, um, life becomes all around us more coherent and more enjoyable. Uh, so I absolutely encourage people to explore this deeper. There's a lot to learn and it's a fun rabbit hole to dive into. Absolutely. It's uh, a lot of fun. And I can assure my listeners that my shoulders are way, feel just, just a lot softer yeah. when I came in. So that was just a few minutes work. All right. Thanks. Thanks, right. Aileen. I'll let you go. This has been All awesome. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Take care. Bye.